Thank you, Barb. Good morning, everyone. How very good it is that you have come as we together enter into the holiest week in our liturgical calendar as Christians. Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus arrived in Jerusalem after his lengthy pilgrimage from the northern country of Galilee, come to lay down his life for all people and to challenge those powers of darkness and death that assault us. And we've all been assaulted by them, so we have come to the place where we are gathered in the name of Jesus, who has dominion over those powers that we too might be set free. I'm so glad you're here. Those of you present, those of you at home, what we're doing together is so important. So please rise and join me in the call to worship. Rejoice, friends of God, for our King comes to us triumphant in love and humbled as a servant. I tell you, if we were silent, even the stones would shout out. Praise be to God. Amen. Our opening hymn is Hosanna, Loud Hosanna, the first three verses. do indeed rejoice because we have gathered in the presence of Jesus who has come to us in our deep need. You know the powers of darkness. They've held us each in bondage in unique ways. We struggle. We seek to live that life that God has created too and we stumble. But there is mercy in the Lord. Jesus comes tenderly to us with grace. And I declare to you that you are truly God's beloved children whom God cherishes. And a place is prepared for you in the kingdom of heaven. Your sins are forgiven. This is a new beginning. And let us lift up our voices as one voice now and sing the song of Alleluia. Alleluia.
Jesus has come to teach us the things that make for peace. He is the peace of God. He gives us that peace that brings down the walls that separate us one from another, from our truest self, from the God who gave us life. We are brought home, and this peace welcomes us. Let's claim this peace. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Amen. Please be seated, and our choir is going to raise up an anthem to the praise of God. Terry. Thank you, choir. That was beautiful. So, I'm not going to forget this week. <laughs> this morning, we have jeans. 
and Malachi's <laughs> loving beasts as part of the circle. Buttons, the cat, Chester, the dog. All God's crit. Do I have it wrong? Okay, I, I, I thought I sent you a text asking that, and you didn't <laughs> respond. I thought Buttons is surely a cat, and Chester's surely a dog, but I have it wrong. <laughs> I've been known to make a few mistakes. Nonetheless, even when I get their names wrong, they are part of the circle of God's love, God's creation. All living creatures are, are part of God's circle. And uh, in, in our story today, we're going to hear how Jesus says, if these don't cry out, even the stones would cry out. And I bet Buttons and Chester would cry out and praise too with Jesus. So we've been tracking the season of Lent, right? It started long ago on Ash Wednesday. We've had 40 days, not counting the Sundays. We came to the first Sunday of Lent. We came to the second Sunday of Lent. We came to the third Sunday of Lent. We came to the fourth Sunday of Lent. Last week was the fifth Sunday of Lent. And we've reached what's today? Holler it out. Palm Sunday. We've reached Palm Sunday, which means that Jesus arrives in Jerusalem where he's been traveling for all this time. And he's going to teach in the temple each day. The first thing he did was drive out the money changers from the temple. But on, th on Thursday night, who knows what happens on Thursday night? Terry knows the Last Supper was a Passover meal, Seder. He was gathered, as all the Jews were, for the Seder, the Passover meal. And with his, his disciples, he had what we call his Last Supper, which is what we remember every time we have Holy Communion together. And what happened on Good Friday? Y yes, Matt. He got put on the cross. He died. It was a very sad, sad day. But then he was in the tomb on Saturday and on Easter next Sunday. Nikki? He rose from the dead and gave great joy to the very sad disciples, women and men both. Okay. On this day, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And it tells us that his disciples greeted him by putting palm branches down on the road in front of him. And they also took their coats off and put that on, on him. And he was on a humble donkey. Not a big war horse like the Romans would have used. But nonetheless, he was welcomed as the king. Now, we have a tradition, which we haven't done in a couple of years. And we're going to do it in a very modified fashion this morning. Just so we can feel like we have come back into the joy uh, there's Austin playing the part of Jesus and Ryan being the donkey. Thank you, Ryan, for your humility in doing that. Okay. Um, Christina, would you play Jesus for me today? And Donna, you don't have to get down on your knees, but you can be the one who rides beside as supposedly like the don donkey. Okay, so you all, so all other children, come on up. Tommy and Matt, come get a palm branch and come get a piece of cloth. Okay, come. Connie, that should just take them from here, right? There's some on the altar. Those would be the easy ones to take. All right. Here you go. Here is a palm branch for you. Remember, not swords, palm branches. There you go, Matt. Okay. Uh, but you're Jesus, so you're on... Triplets. Where are you, triplets? Okay, Christi Christina, since you're Jesus, you get all this stuff done to you. You don't actually have a palm branch. You get to be Jesus. Here you go, Abby. Here you go, Maddie. Here you go, Nikki. Do we have any other children in the house? Okay. All right. Now, it also says that they put their, palm, their, their coats down. Here with the two, there's a big one. The two of you take that. All right. And two of you take that one. And you get that one, okay. And I'll take one too. 
All right, so let's go line up. Let's go, let's, how, how, how do we do it? Let's do it right here. So let's put Tommy and Matt here, and we'll put Nikki and Maddie and Abby here. Okay, just to, we are going to say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, we have another child. Melania, I'm so glad you're here because we needed a third over here to balance it out. Here is your coat that you get to put down. And here is your palm branch. Not a sword, a palm branch right here. Okay. All right. Let's everybody practice. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Sound pretty good. How does it feel to be Jesus coming into the city riding on a donkey? It feels awful. Yeah. So awesome. <laughs> I would have thought that was interesting. <laughs> it feels awesome. Yes, it feels awesome because, and particularly in the version we get in Luke's gospel, because the, what happens is some of the Pharisees come up when they're crying, let's practice it one more time, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They are welcoming Jesus as the king. And that's a dangerous thing to do because Caesar is the emperor and he doesn't want any kings under him. But uh, so the Pharisees say, tell your followers to stop yelling that. And does anybody know what he, yell, what he says? I made reference to it with Chester and Buttons. <laughs> he says, if they didn't cry out, even the stones would cry out. So, there was a lot of joy there. All right, so, all right, so what you two are going to do, you're going to slowly walk forward. And as they come forward, we're all going to be chanting, blessed is the one who comes in the Lord. You're going to lay down your cloth and your palm branch. And Christina's going to walk right up. And, and unfortunately, what is she? What are you walking towards, Christina? The, the palm tree and the cross. The cross. That's the hard part of the story. It's awesome, but it's also, what was the word I thought you said? Uh, awful. awful. It's a combination of awesome and awful. So we got it together. Because you're going to go lay down your life for all people. All right, everybody ready? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All right. How'd that feel? Good. That felt good. Well done, everybody. And uh, let's all pretend we're the stones now. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is Jesus. Thank you for playing Jesus. Jesus said whenever we welcome one of the children in our midst, we're welcoming Jesus. So Jesus is actually disguised inside you. You did a wonderful job playing the part of Jesus. All right, we can all go back to our seats. Might as well leave that there, huh? Okay. We want to be praying this morning. Who shall we pray for? We're going to pray for the people of Ukraine who are having a hard, hard time. Anybody else you'd like to pray for this morning? Children? Okay. Mom, mom. We'll pray for mom, mom. Thank you, Christina, for lifting up mom, mom. All right. Let's pray together. And oh, and we always say at the end of our children's time. There's always room in the circle. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus, who came humbly riding on a donkey with love for all. Truly, Jesus is our King, our Lord. Help us to humble ourselves before his great love. Thank you for our children today. They are so beautiful and precious, and they help us to see Jesus we pray for all in this world who are feeling lonely or scared or overwhelmed, all who are hungry, all who are in the midst of fighting, 
We pray for peace. We pray for mom, mom, for all who are sick, are lonely. We pray for the people of Ukraine, the children, the parents, the soldiers, all of them. We pray for your protection, your peace, your strength. We pray for an end of the violence that Jesus might work in the hearts of those who are doing violence. And hear us now as we pray the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And let's wave to little Michael. Michael is getting a little baby brother or sister this week. So let's pray for Michael and Julia and especially his, their mom, Anna. And you all can go to Sunday school if you want to. And you can also stay here if you want to. Whatever you want to do. All right. Thank you, Sunday school teachers. Much appreciated. Our hymn is the third verse of Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. I invite you to rise. Please be seated. <coughs> what was the giggling about? I missed that. Man, who is that who types up these things? <laughs> you better fire them. <laughs> Send them into retirement or something, I think. I just assumed you all knew the words, that's all. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah, right. Okay. Every week I make a mistake. It's all intentional. I wanted to make sure you catch it so you're paying attention. All right. Okay. So we have the reading that tells the story in Luke's version. All of the different gospel writers tell the story slightly different. Luke's version of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. Uh, it takes place in the 19th chapter. Uh, shortly before this, Jesus has been approaching uh, Jerusalem. He comes first to the town of uh, Jericho. And while he's there, there's this blind man begging who calls out to him for mercy. Jesus calls him forward and gives him his sight. It's a wonderful demonstration of the power of Jesus to heal and give sight, uh, particularly to those who are on the edges. And after that, we have, we've got uh, the blind beggar, but shortly after that, we have the story about Zacchaeus, the rich tax collector, who Jesus warms his heart so that he repents of the ways that he has been harming the people, ripping them off, and he gives half of his money away and makes right for all his wrongs. So we get these demonstrations of the power of Jesus right before this. So I pick up the story here in the 19th chapter, beginning in the 28th verse. Listen for the word of the Lord. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you 
and as you enter, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. As those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And he rode along. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Which you might remember as an echo to what the angels said to the shepherds at the beginning of Luke. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, even the stones would shout out. Thus ends the reading of the scripture. May the Lord bless our hearing of the word. So the way that Luke tells this story, uh, Jesus is very much in control as he enters the city of Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. His directions to the disciples regarding how to acquire the donkey almost give you the feel that he's micromanaging the whole event. Throughout his gospel, Luke makes it clear that Jesus had a great many followers beyond the inner circle of the 12 that we commonly refer to as the disciples. And in Luke's version, it is this great group of disciples, specifically, who are welcoming Jesus into the city, celebrating his arrival. And it's specifically his remarkable power, which they have seen on display, that causes them to rejoice. They've witnessed him deliver people from sickness, cast out demons, he see, they've seen him miraculously feed the hungry. He has cast forth these forces that oppress and diminish life. The disciples uh, in that inner circle have even seen him uh, have displays of power over the forces of nature. That's, that story of him silencing the storm on the, the boat ride across the Sea of Galilee. And so rejoicing in his power, they welcome Jesus as the long-awaited king, come to deliver the people from their bondage to Rome and to the oppression of the religious authorities. With all the Roman soldiers who are hanging out in Jerusalem, proclaiming Jesus to be the king is indeed dangerous, and so the Pharisees tell him to stop his disciples from crying this out, but he won't do it. He is not intimidated. He comes humbly riding on a donkey and yet powerful at the same time with this innate authority that no one has ever seen before in somebody. And the first act that Jesus does entering Jerusalem is to forcibly drive out the money changers and those selling animals for sacrifice in the temple, those who, they're taking advantage of the poor pilgrims who have traveled a long distance in order to make sacrifices in the temple to atone for sin. And what Jesus does there is the closest thing he ever does to an act of violence, though there's no mention that anybody got wounded. Um, Jesus simply compels there to be no more business of that sort done that day. 
And although Jesus is often pictured, if you do a Google search, Jesus uh, cleansing the temple, you will invariably see Jesus holding a whip. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's no whip. It's only John who says that. So what's happening here is essentially a symbolic prophetic event that Jesus has orchestrated in the temple. It won't bring about a permanent end of the abusive business practices taking place there, but nonetheless, it's a matter of speaking the truth clearly about the injustice happening there. But nonetheless, in short order, the businessmen profiting off the poor will be back to doing business as usual. In the days that follow, to the dismay of the religious authorities, Jesus will freely, openly teach in the temple. On Thursday night, it will appear that Jesus finally loses control of what is happening when he gets arrested. And yet, it is clear that Jesus is allowing himself to be arrested. He knew the soldiers were coming, and he could have easily slipped away in the darkness, but he chose not to. When the soldiers arrive, one of Jesus' disciples initially fights back, swinging a sword that cuts off the ear of one of the soldiers. And Jesus immediately commands that follower to cease, to put down his sword. And then for the last time in his earthly life, Jesus calls forth his power to heal, tenderly healing the ear of this man who could be called an enemy. In Matthew's recounting of the arrest, Jesus says, Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? implying that he has the supernatural power at his disposal that he could just obliterate the soldiers, but he's choosing not to, practicing remarkable restraint. He freely chooses to lay down his life in an act of sacrificial love on behalf of not just some people, but all people. So this is what real strength, real power looks like. It is exercised with restraint, and the choice to put it to use or not is done out of freedom. Two recent news events express the confusion we human beings have regarding what real strength and real power looks like. One involves a man threatening the whole world, Putin's violent invasion of the Ukraine. The other is significantly less consequential, but emotionally evocative nonetheless, and here I'm referring to Will Smith's outburst at the Oscars. Many of us found ourselves greatly disturbed by the incident. Celebrities we've held with affection for a long time can seem as though they're a part of our family in some illusory sense. And so it was with Will Smith who for his 35-year career had established this reputation of being one of the good guys in Hollywood, this likable guy with an easy sense of humor who often played very inspiring characters. And then on live television, in a matter of about 20 seconds, he imploded, committing a disturbing act of violence for all the world to see. It was very much a bad thing to do. First, in setting a terrible example regarding how a man should deal with insults and resolve conflicts, essentially to beat the offender into submission. And second, by damaging his public image and turning attention away from the movie and the story that he had sought to promote. Now, we can only conjecture what compelled Will Smith to act as he did. Surely a range of things converged in the moment to awaken long-standing wounds that were hidden inside Will Smith, his own personal demons, if you will, that up to that moment he had largely managed 
to keep hidden from the public. I choose the word compelled in describing what Will Smith did because I do not believe his act of violence was truly what you would call an act freely taken. Forces he wasn't fully conscious of drove him to act impulsively. Now, many voices have condemned Will Smith, and though I think this particular act should be condemned, I found my reaction to be more of one, there but for the grace of God go I. You know, we all, we all carry wounds around inside of us that we largely manage to keep hidden from view to most people. Perhaps the most intimate people in our life get to glimpse these wounds. You could describe this as our personal bondage to the power of sin. In the Lord's Prayer that we just prayed a little while ago, Jesus instructs us to pray, lead us not into temptation. He does that because, uh, truth be told, just like Will Smith, we are all, we are all capable of doing very destructive things to others and to ourselves. And none of us knows for sure when the circumstances of our lives will conspire to lead us to act in a way that we will spend the rest of our life regretting. So we're left to conjecture regarding the nature of Will Smith's inner wounds. It seems likely that he felt pressure to show himself in the, uh, to the eyes of the world as strong and powerful to fulfill some idea of how a real man should act. In his autobiography, autobiogra autobiograph how do you say that word? Thank you, Terry. <laughs> autobiography. In his autobiography, Will Smith describes an incident from his childhood when he witnessed his father beat his mother and feeling utterly helpless to do that. And you can only imagine that's, that, was, that was in his item that night, you know? He wasn't going to stand by and let that happen. Not this time. Uh, I suspect, uh, in his uh, rambling speech, acceptance speech, just a few minutes after he slapped Chris Rock, Will Smith talked about how he felt called by God to, quote, protect the people he loved. I suspect that fear was a big part of what drove Will Smith that night, a fear he wasn't perhaps directly in touch with. He suddenly felt that he was being presented with a test requiring him to prove his manhood, his personal power, and without time to think it through, he feared failing the test, which ironically is exactly what he did do. He failed the test. Imagine another scenario. Will Smith strides with dignity up onto the stage, and instead of sucker punching a smaller man, he calmly addresses the cruelty of Chris Rock's joke, pointing out that his wife was not bald by choice, but as the result of an emotionally distressing disease. Perhaps he could have acknowledged the possibility that Rock's cruelty arose out of ignorance. Knowing he surely had the power to strike Rock into submission, he could have demonstrated real freedom by choosing not to give in to the temptation to do so, not to give in to the fear, the violence expressed. The world would then have had a remarkable lesson regarding the power of speaking truth in love, something far closer to the way of Jesus. But that would have required a lot more personal insight and perhaps generally a good deal more time to reflect than Will Smith felt that he had. He acted not out of freedom, but out of bondage to hate and fear. There but for the grace of God go we. Vladimir Putin has far less self-awareness than Will Smith. 
and unlike Will Smith, seems utterly incapable of acknowledging how much harm he has done. The violence that Putin has unleashed on the world also rises out of, not out of freedom, but rather a bondage that Putin is loath to acknowledge, the compulsive need to prove that he matters, that he is somebody with whom the world must reckon. It's a compulsion on his part, not a free act. Real power, as well as perhaps real manhood, comes from a state of inner freedom. It is expressed when done so with restraint. It arises from an inner confidence that one's life already matters and you don't have to prove it. And Jesus shows us what that looks like. So as we enter Holy Week, I invite you to ponder the remarkable freedom of Jesus and the remarkable restraint with which he chooses to act. Reflect also on the fact that those who conspire to have Jesus kill, kill the people wielding the power of violence, ultimately turn to violence because on some deep level they are afraid. Afraid of losing their authority, losing the meaning and significance of their lives which they see as depending on their desperate hold on a place in the social order that is higher than others. They don't know that they are God's beloved children and they don't need to claim, cling to that place. I invite you to come on Thursday to hear the story uh, be read of Jesus' last 24 hours on earth as told by Luke. And if you can't make it, I invite you to open up your Bible and find Luke's reading and read it for yourself. If you do, you will hear how at the Last Supper, just after Jesus tells his disciples that that very night fear will overtake them and they will all fall away, their response is it's remarkable. Their response is to get into an argument with one another regarding which of them is the greatest. It's so deeply ingrained in we human beings, this need to find significance by being superior to others. They're desperate to feel that superiority. And in response to their argument about who's the greatest, Jesus speaks these words to the disciples. The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, but not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, like a little child, and the leader like one who serves. I was struck by the words of wisdom that Will Smith reported Denzel Washington whispering to him in the TV break. He said, the devil comes for you at your highest moment. Right after Jesus told his disciples that true greatness comes from freely choosing the role of a servant, there's this remarkable moment. He turns to Simon Peter and speaks to him directly. He says, in, he says this devil's coming for you. That's what he says, and I quote, Simon, Simon, listen, Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers, which in turn simply triggers Simon Peter uh, to, to his compulsive need to express bravado to deny the fear that's rising up so powerfully inside of him. He declares with bravado, I am willing to die with you, Jesus. At which point, Jesus tells him, this night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. The first step towards overcoming our fears is admitting the depths of our fears. If you don't face your fears, they will rule your life. They will take away your freedom. It is striking to me that when Jesus tells Peter that 
he's been praying for him that his faith won't fail, <clears throat> he already knows that that very night his fear will take Simon Peter hostage. He knows that very night that Simon Peter will fail the test, which means that the faith Jesus is praying for G Peter to have is not the faith to stand tall that night. No, it's the faith to humbly embrace the grace he will be offered when he descends into despair, when he is so painfully aware of his own brokenness, his own failure. It's the, it's the faith to get up from the ashes and try again. And in rising anew, as one who walks in humility, which is actually strength and not false bravado, uh, to, as Jesus said, turn back to your brothers in their inevitable stumblings. To, quote, strengthen them, Jesus said, by showing them the grace that he will be given. There but for the grace of God go we. Because the truth is, we will repeatedly fail the tests life presents us with to demonstrate what real strength and real power looks like. The freedom of one who chooses the path of the servant, the way of Jesus. In Luke's gospel, it's Luke's gospel in which we will hear Jesus on the cross say, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And this is what real freedom looks like. This is what real power and strength looks like. The power to forgive. And you don't have to, but choosing out of love to forgive. So as we keep watch this week with Jesus, let us pay attention to the temptations to succumb to what the devil would invite us to do. To give in to the compulsive need to say, win arguments, Compulsive need to seek revenge, to withhold forgiveness. The compulsive need to deny our common human frailty and weakness. Let's embrace the opportunities, the many opportunities that life presents us with to practice mercy. For such is what the world needs so badly right now. Please pray with me. Truly, O oh God, there but for the grace of God go we. We are grateful for all the ways <clears throat> in which you have protected us from, from the powers of darkness in ways we weren't even aware of. We thank you for your constant presence with us and love for us even when we stumble and see ourselves in the worst light. We thank you for the mercy of Jesus and ask that we might enter into that mercy and that humility this week as we ponder anew his story, his great love for all people. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. Our hymn is All Praise to Thee, the first and the third verse. I invite you to rise.
Please be seated. This is the symbolic time in our service where we hold the offering. There is an offering plate in the foyer for those of you who have an offering, financial offering to make. I want to just thank you once more because what we are doing together as the church, trying to live out as best we can the gospel of Jesus is critically important in this broken world we live in with so much division, so much hostility, so much despair. We have been entrusted with a precious message and we're living it out together and it's so important. So thank you for the ways in which you support our common ministry, your financial gifts, your prayers, the sharing of your talents. It is so important what we're doing together. Before we move into prayer, I'm, uh, invite us to say together a litany of prayer as we enter into the passion of Jesus. So we're sort of shifting from, from Palm Sunday into that, that story that is before us. Have more time? Okay. Heal us, Lord. Heal us, Forgive us, Lord. Lead us Grant us mercy, Lord. Grant us strength, Lord. For the journey is long. Grant us courage, Lord. For there are people who need us to be brave. Amen. I want to acknowledge that Diane Anderson is with us today. Diane, so good to have you with us. Diane recently had surgery, and she's back with us. Uh, and good to have you here, Diane. Um, and Diane's got a important doctor's appointment coming up this week of some concern. So we'll be praying for Diane. I will be pausing as we pray uh, once for a time of being in touch with our joys, our thanksgivings, our gratitude. I will pause again for us to invite the Holy Spirit into that place of our own deepest need that we're aware of. And then I'll pause a third time for us to share cares, concerns that we would would raise up into the gracious light of our Lord. Please pray with me. We would enter into that stillness, O oh God, in which we can hear the stones crying out in praise of you. We would enter into that stillness of our breath, where we are aware that you are giving us life with each inhale. You have called us into life to be a part of this great, wondrous journey, full of so much wonder, so much reason to be in awe, so much to be grateful for. And we give you thanks. We thank you for the beauty of the earth in springtime after the long winter. We thank you for the beauty of music that stirs our hearts and allows us to sense a holy eternal realm where love prevails. We thank you for our beautiful children who show us the way to you, your kingdom. We thank you for those who have lived many years upon this earth and from many fallings and risings have learned to walk with you humbly in the way of love and from whom a great light shines. We thank you for our church. We thank you for every act of kindness and mercy that we have experienced particularly those that have occurred to us, been given to us in our times of deep frailty. Simple acts of kindness that have encouraged us to put another step in front of the last one we took. Simple acts of encouragement that helped us to get out of ourself, to laugh with somebody, perhaps to cry with somebody, 
We thank you for those opportunities that you've given us to be the answer of prayers for others. For that is indeed why you put us on this earth, to be expressions of your love. We thank you for courage in all its many forms, far and away and close at hand. We thank you for healings. We thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for Jesus and the good news of his gospel. Lord, in your goodness, Betsy Adams shares the joy of going out with the women's group last Sunday. And I second that joy. We had a we had a really good time. The play was really fun. Thank you, O oh God, for our blessings. Always far more than we can name or acknowledge. You have graced us wondrously, and we trust that your grace will open us up to recognize the many ways in which we have been blessed and have been oblivious. And we would acknowledge our own brokenness, our own bondage, <clears throat> the blockages of our hearts that keep us from fully loving like Jesus fully receiving the gift of joy. In this moment of silence, we invite your Holy Spirit to descend into the hearts, the minds, the bodies of each one of us <clears throat> to come and minister to that place where we are aware of bondage. Come, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> And perhaps in some small way, O oh Lord, we experience a greater freedom as you have moved within our hearts to lead us toward a deeper love. And perhaps we have heard a call from you to offer ourselves as servants to others. And this call begins with prayer. We do not understand the mystery that is prayer, but we trust that as we raise up in our hearts persons, situations of deep need, trusting that you know the needs already, that somehow our prayers give you an opportunity to move your spirit in this world. And so we begin by praying for the people of the Ukraine so much suffering taking place, children, families, those who've been orphaned, those who have been brought a great grief, those who are caught up in violence. We pray for soldiers on both sides. We pray for hardened hearts to be melted by your love. We pray for needs for healing and comfort. We pray for Paul Adams' family, who has suffered two great losses in quick succession. Paul's aunt Irene, his mother's sister, died Friday. And Paul's cousin Irv died Saturday. And Paul's mother, is very sick, and her care, what she needs, is still being decided. We pray for Paul as he will need to fly back to Missouri this week to support his mother. We pray also for Lori Wilkin and her father, as Lori has traveled to be at her father's bedside in a hospital as he appears to be dying. Bring your comfort to them. We pray for Arlene Sklo as she will undergo gallbladder surgery on Tuesday. We 
pray for Kathy Anderson, who has asked for prayers for continued recovery from her uterine surgery and to continue to be cancer-free. We pray for Anna Igorova as, and the babe within her womb as they approach the day of the child's delivery. Bring them comfort and grace. Be with Julia and Michael. We pray for Anna Crystal's mother, Muriel, and for Diane Morgan, both in nursing homes. We pray for her daughter, Donna. We pray for Diane Anderson, who we're grateful to have this morning as she's recovering from surgery and as she goes to consult a doctor about an enlarged lymph node in her lung, let your healing grace be with her. We thank you that Heddle and Terry are with us today after having gone through recent surgeries and ask their continued healing. We pray for all who are grieving, and that includes all of us. We are knit together in grief. We pray for our earth, for all living beings, for the network of life, and for the ways in which the earth has been damaged. Help us to be better stewards. We pray for the hungry and the home, homeless, the most vulnerable among us, orphan children, those who are widowed, those who've lost their loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, Each of us, O oh Lord, places our cares into your eternal light and love. Help us to trust you. Help us to trust that you know far better than we do what needs to happen and that we are in your hands and you will never abandon us. We thank you for Jesus who has joined us in the very worst of life by taking the cross suffering that death. We know you're with us, O oh God, in our darkest hours, and that you will lead us through all fear, all despair, into your great hope that we will celebrate next Sunday, your victory over the powers of death. Help us, O oh Lord, <clears throat> to walk humbly the path that is set before us, to witness to your gospel. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn is a verse of What Wondrous Love Is This. Please rise. Please be seated. I invite you to join me in our liturgy for the blessing of the palms. Gracious, nurturing God, this day our Savior Jesus entered Jerusalem 
and was proclaimed king by those who spread their garments and palm branches along his way. Let these branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear Christ's name may willingly walk with him towards the cross, towards death, towards resurrection, so that we may enter into your peaceable kingdom, the promise and hope of human history from ages unto ages. Amen. Before the final benediction, we pause for announcements pertaining to the life of the church. There will be coffee hour in person following the benediction hosted by Tom Albert. Good old Tom Albert. <laughs> and there will also be coffee hour online for those of you at home. Uh, there are opportunities to connect, as always, this week on Zoom with Joanne on Mondays at 1 o'clock and Betsy on Fridays at noon. I continue to offer guided meditation and prayer time on Zoom on Wednesday and Thursdays at noon. There are those among you who can talk about how it has helped you find peace in the midst of storms. Tim Tyler's final session of the Lenten class is this Tuesday at 7 o'clock. He's going to tie it all together, right, Tim? So uh, even if you've missed other sessions, it, I think you'll find it insightful, helpful to join if you want to, 7 o'clock on Zoom. We are in Holy Week, so that means that Monday, Thursday, this Thursday, we will gather at 7 o'clock, as is our tradition. It will also be online. And we will share Holy Communion, remembering the Last Supper of Jesus. We also will do our tradition of the Tenebrae service, which involves 16 different people taking pieces of the story of Jesus' last night and his crucifixion on Friday. There are readings out there on the table. If you'd like to take one, take one. Write down your name under what number you've taken. And I'll have a copy here waiting for you in case you forget, like I would and leave your reading at home, but take it home and practice. Uh, I'd love to have 16 different readers. Good Friday, we are having the, a modified version of our crosswalk tradition, beginning at one o'clock at St. Gregory's up the road. Uh, there'll be a simple service on the front lawn. Uh, we will progress down South Beverwick with police escort, pausing to read prayers for the Stations of the Cross, and then have a very brief service here on our front lawn. The whole thing will pay, take uh, less than an hour, perhaps 45 minutes, and I invite you to join us. Uh, homeless Solutions, our ministry every other month to feed the hungry at Homeless Solutions is taking place on Monday, Thursday, this Thursday and offerings to support that ministry are invited. The choir continues to meet, and there's room in the circle, as is there for Motley Crew Christian Band, which will perform on Easter Sunday. We want to continue to connect people who need someone to go shopping for them. Reach out. There have got people here willing to do so, and if you are in time of financial straits, we have a discretionary fund We've given generously to reach out. We're here to help. And we're also collecting ongoing food to go to the Parsippany Food Pantry. We invite you to bring that to the church as well. And thank you for your ongoing support. Um, I have a question. Um, Denise, do you know if the food pantry is accepting um, the turkeys and hams and things from, Shop you know, like if you get a free one from ShopRite, do you have any idea? They haven't said anything? Okay. Um, we were just wondering, so I thought other people might be wondering too. I believe they fresh. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Okay, you're looking for those of you who've gotten free hams to give them away. Yeah, yeah, that okay. would be good, yeah, if you could find out because those of us that might be eligible to get one but can't yeah. use it, we could right. donate. We can find a way to put that to use. Diane. Wonderful. Thank you. 
That's very helpful, Diane. Thank you. So that makes expedites well, things. You go ahead and repeat that. <laughs> Diane uh, Anderson has shared that the ShopRite in Parsippany will take your turkey or ham or whatever and will donate it for you. So if you want to do that, I guess they will make that arrangement for you. Okay. And I failed to mention that next Sunday after the worship service, we will hold, the youth will be holding uh, the traditional Easter egg hunt on the front lawn. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Okay. Garrett. Uh, this week, the Saturday, we have Mr. Faith Furnishings. We do? You sure? Is this a recent thing or did it get some back? Okay. Okay, well, yeah, it was not, it was not a special, they were just looking for volunteers, that's right. Okay, not our specific, okay. Okay, the, anybody who is available to help Andrew Faith Furnishing is this coming Saturday, they could use help uh, with, or have, hard time getting volunteers with all of the high holy days that are converging. Okay. All right. Please rise for the final benediction. Jesus has made his journey to Jerusalem where he speaks the truth in love and comes willing to lay down his life for all people. Let us go forth and in our humble attempts follow in his way. Let us be expressions of the grace of God to those we meet. Help us to practice your mercy and grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wait, make it, huh?